Hi, my name is Ben Zweibelson, and I'm one of the design educators here at the Joint Special Operations University. And I'm Frank Rundis, one of the design faculty here at Joint Special Operations University. And we're here today to talk to you about the paper roll exercise. This is part of our design facilitation series where we unpack and explain in great detail many of the unique design facilitation techniques that we use here at the Joint Special Operations University. JSAO provides education to include, in our case, design education to the U.S. Special Operations Command or SOCOM enterprise, as well as international partners and other government and uh, federal agencies. This facilitation series is where we unpack all the different techniques that we use that are unique to this course. We also have already uploaded the day one JAWS exercise, which is what basic design students experience in the first hour, as well as the puzzle exercise, which is something that we do usually around day two of our five-day course. This is the paper roll, and we normally do this on the third day of a five-day course. The paper roll activity immerses students in reflexive practice and allows them to deeply consider how and why they think and allows them to address those issues, their actions, and so on. The paper roll exercise, it's, it's really geared towards exposing how we think and our process of ideation. So when an organization asks, well, we need you to think outside of the box, we need you to be creative, we need you to come up with something really new, and then we go about our business ideating in a very narrow band, not realizing that we're doing it, and just generating sometimes a high quantity, but a low quality of ideas. At JSA, we believe in teaching design through immersion and not through just reading books and sitting through presentations. This immersion allows students to learn while doing and is much more effective when trying to teach these big ideas and trying to change a student's thinking and therefore change an organization's thinking as you move forward. And then the last part of this exercise in terms of its, its overall purpose is that it helps that transition from thinking about our thinking and what we're doing wrong in our ideation, or, or not necessarily wrong, but insufficient, um, to rapidly proto prototyping in a, a wide range of, of directions with really increasingly creative and sophisticated opportunities. Now, uh, what we like to do is we position this exercise around the third day of our five-day course, and it's a real energizer. It gets everyone excited. You're putting it uh, at a low period, maybe mid-morning or right after lunch, is a great way to supercharge the rest of the day. It ties into a lot of our lesson plans and moving students towards multiple futures and then prototyping a design deliverable for the sponsor. However, if you're doing this uh, with a, a group development or if you're doing this outside of a course, it's still a great energizer and it still achieves that purpose of getting people to say, oh, look what we're doing. We're trying to think creatively and we're actually converging in. We've fallen into another one of our institutional traps. And that's part of the whole point of this. You can do this activity with as few as 10 students, or as many as 30 to 40. Any more than that is recommended that you break the students into smaller groups. As for the environment, you need an area, either inside or outside, if the weather's nice enough, that the students can stand in a circle comfortably and be able to pass the roll of paper around. So the roll of paper is key here in how you construct it. Uh, we normally just go with a, a simple, uh, meter long or yard long uh, roll of paper. If it's butcher block or a single sheet, that's best. If you've got to connect some paper, that's okay. Just don't put too much tape on it. We're gonna get into the rules and what will happen with the paper roll throughout the game, but you definitely don't wanna make it so that it can't be ripped or manipulated or even unraveled. Just enough tape to, to make sure it holds that form initially is all you'll need, and, and then we'll get into what's going to happen during the game next. To start the game off, we tell the students that the purpose of the game is to use the paper roll to act something out. 
there are only two rules to this game. First, while you're acting out, you cannot talk. And second, you cannot repeat what other students have done. Be very precise in these, telling these rules, otherwise the students will be confused and it will degrade the message of the game. Right, and so the precision of those two rules, uh, it's, it's going to open up what you're going to see during the game, which is that collectively and individually, uh, each group is going to socially construct all these additional non-rules that will start govern, governing their behavior. And what's really interesting is that as this happens, you, you can see it. One of the first couple that you'll see even in the first round is speed. As soon as the paper roll gets to them, they want to get it out of their hands as fast as possible. And there's this like pressure for them to perform. Secondly, there becomes this fear of, well, someone might steal my idea. I need to get it to me. It, it almost becomes competitive where they don't want to help anyone. They want to hope that nobody gets their idea. Uh, there's things such as they can't use other objects around them or uh, having a partner help them with the paper roll to acting things out. And then even more of these rules are just going to be coming out of nowhere and they'll be silent, but it's all going to happen right in front of you. After the students understand the purpose and rules of the game, act out something for the students to guess. This could be a baseball bat, a golf club, or even a bow and arrow, but be sure to keep the paper roll in its rigid state. Again, this is about the students forming their own non-rules in their head, and that is actually the purpose of this game to start it out. Right, and Frank's exactly right. We intentionally do that uh, rigid object that looks a lot like the paper roll itself because this has to do with creativity and ideation and patterns. And what's going to happen is we are priming everybody in the room to think the paper roll object should look like what I'm trying to think about for everyone to guess. And so around the room, we're going to see very similar things to baseball bats in the first round, right? Exactly. So as that first round occurs, you'll see hockey sticks, uh, a gun. Um, they, they will use something. Uh, mops, mops, bazookas, uh, um, limbo poles, crutches, canes, everything, anything that it's a long cylindrical object, uh, a stick they will use the paper roll in that method because they'll have it in their head that the paper roll is the paper roll. And that's part of the learning process. Right. And so as the paper roll goes around the room, there's a couple of things you want to look for in that first round as a facilitator. Um, first of all, take a good look at everyone's expressions to your immediate left and right. And, and, and Frank and I, we love doing this with our faculty is, which way is the role going to go first? And how do students respond if you fake them out, like you're going to go to the right and then you hand it to the people on the left, the expressions of the people that now realize yeah. they're at the end of the line. What, what, what oh, happens? Yeah. They, 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 get, they get kind of frustrated because they know their idea is probably going to get stolen from somebody else. And you, you'll see expressions from people farther down the line when somebody else steals their idea and it's, it borders on a, a look of panic almost, like, oh man, that was my idea, now I gotta think of something else in, in order to, to win this game, that competitive nature. Right, and so that's what you're looking for in this first round is that by default, because of how our organizational frames are set, most people enter this competition thinking that there's a finite number of things they can ideate upon or create, that it's, it's a race to get to your idea before someone steals it. The other things that you'll notice in this first round is that people are going to rapidly do their idea and pass it almost like a hot potato. Once again, we talked about how everything is going to look like a, a paper roll. And then also you're probably not going to see people using partners, people using objects around the room, such as if there's furniture, incorporating that in. And then lastly, very rarely do you see people bend or twist or crumple the paper in the first round. You might at the most get somebody to bend it around their waist like a belt, but then they restore it and try to clean it up before they hand it off. And that's a very good point. Every time in this first round normally, if they do something different than a long cylindrical object, they will very uh, quickly try to restore that paper roll back to its previous state. And so let's go into how do you unpack the first round uh, of the paper roll exercise after it makes it all the way around the circle and gets back to you as the facilitator. Mm -hmm. 
So at the end of round one, when the paper roll makes its way back to you as the lead facilitator, uh, remember that there'll be other design facilitators normally in the circle assisting you. And once I get the paper back normally, so if, if Frank is in the group, he normally positions him, himself closer to the end of the circle. And he already knows that when the paper roll gets to him, particularly if the students have all done that funk, uh, rigidity of the uh, ideation, He's going to do something slightly different, something to provoke them during the unpack, such as using another object with his paper roll or enlisting a couple of partners to help him. So then once I get the paper roll, I start asking them, what did we see? What are some of the patterns? And once we get past the establishment that everyone basically did stick type objects with the paper roll and that that becomes a very narrow band of ideation and experimentation, then we start getting into what were some of the outliers? Did anyone do anything unusual? So as we look at uh, the unusual, normally the facilitator will be the only one that have, has done something unusual. And there will be a discussion of rules at that point. So the discussion of rules, uh, there will be a lot of the students who will say that was against the rules. And you'll have to remind them of what the two rules, the only two rules of the paper roll exercise were. From that point, you need to talk to, talk to them about um, the number of ideas. Did anybody feel like they were running out, out of ideas? Could they think of anything else uh, when their idea got stolen? How hard that was to highlight that these created rules, these non-rules, and how they were limiting their thinking. Exactly. So we always want to ask them, how do you feel? How do you feel about this exercise? And the first round, most people feel apprehensive, a little bit stressed. Uh, when we ask the question, how many of you had your, I, your first idea stolen? And, and you'll see at least half of the hands, if not three quarters of the hands come up. And so that tells you two things. And you want to have this discussion with the group. Why is it that when we have a paper roll that could be anything, so many of you thought of the same things? So going back to the whole purpose of military design is that an organization is trying to think outside of the box, to think creatively, but when we get groups together over and over reliably, we end up generating the same exact ideas, even when the, the, the box is opened and we can say it can be anything. And then that last piece, which is really important, is addressing the belief that we're running out of ideas that each round there'll just be less and less ideas that, that, will, that will eventually, someone will get stalemate. They'll get the paper roll and they can't think of anything else. And this is key because we want to shift them off of that. And also, if you're teaching a class where all the students are from the same organization, you can use this, this moment to look at the pattern and trend of the ideas the students had. So that pattern trend probably is very similar and that tends to look towards how the organization thinks as well. Absolutely. So let's, uh, let's move on to round two. And uh, you don't want to give everything away in the first round unpack. You want to just give a little bit so that it opens up their patterns, their aperture. Uh, and then we'll move on to round two where things really start to get interesting. So when we start round two, uh, if you're the lead facilitator, first I like to put the paper roll going in a different order um, so that it goes around the circle a different way. And once again, look at the faces, watch the expressions of, oh, I get to go first now versus, oh no, I'm at the very end. Uh, secondly, you always want to challenge the paper roll construct by demonstrating something that now looks very different. In the first round, as Frank mentioned, he does a baseball bat or a golf club, which fixates them onto something that's cylindrical, uh, like the paper roll itself. Now we want to get into distorting its entire form and function, scale, scope, everything. So uh, one of mine I like to use is curling, so the, the sport of curling. Uh, I'll ask a partner to help me, and I'll say, hey, I want you to throw the paper roll roll down this arrow or this area here um, as if it's that big huge puck type thing and then I run alongside it doing the brush thing just with my hands. I don't use the paper roll for that because once again now I'm distorting the object intentionally and this is unlocking a couple new examples for the students of using partners, distorting the shape, ideating differently, creating new patterns and this hopefully primes the pump if you will in a different way and you should start seeing that right away with round two. 
Yeah, so uh, you'll see students start to, to use the paper roll as like a baby or something like that, completely realizing that, oh, it doesn't have to be a stick, it doesn't have to be a paper roll, it can be anything it wants to be. And that's what you want to see in round two. But there are also some interesting things you will see as well. If a student decides to unroll the paper, you'll see students that attempt it but realize it's too hard and, 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 and give up on it and then completely switch to another idea and revert back to that round one thinking and just use it as a stick instead of something that gets them outside their comfort zone and outside their box. Or if they succeed in unrolling it, they'll once they're done, they'll roll it up real tight again, tape it back together and then hand it off to the next student versus leaving in its unrolled form and continue down. But if they start changing the form of it, also look at the group and look at the expressions on the faces. When somebody changes the form of the paper, it ruins the ideas other people had as well. And it's interesting to see how they react. Absolutely. And that's a key thing to look for. We don't know when it happens. Usually it's either round two or round three, where that first student either hesitates, they kind of look around, and then they, they, they jump in. They, they either crumble it up and do a basketball shot, or they'll wrap it around their head for a hat, or, or some will boldly start to rip the tape and unroll it. And as they do this, you'll see them kind of looking around silently for permission or forgiveness. And then you'll see the next couple of people just suddenly looking puzzled like, oh, I, I don't know what I'm going to do now because it's not a, it's not a cylindrical object. Uh, and you want to pay attention to that because at the end of round two or three, wherever it happens, you definitely want to address that. And then once that happens, it's almost like the genie's out of the box. And it accelerates the students into laughing, joking, doing all kinds of crazy things with the paper to a certain point is that until we're going to get to the to the ripping, uh, but everyone tries to restore it to a role, uh, and they also are under time constraints to keep doing it quickly. Yeah, and even students that get the, the paper in the unrolled form will tend to roll it back up, put it back in its original form in order to continue with their original idea versus expand their thinking and do something new and creative. And that brings us to the, uh, the round two uh, unpack uh, and then what to set up for round three, which is where you really want to put uh, one or two events in there to really get to the learning objectives of this exercise. Now to unpack round two, it's going to be very similar to unpacking round one. You're gonna ask students how they feel about that round. You're gonna talk about how they came up with their ideas, how they felt when ideas were stolen. And you're also gonna talk about the increased diversity of the different ideas. Absolutely, and what's interesting about round two versus round one is you're gonna see a greater variety of ideation. And this is key for us with design because once again, this exercise really hones in on a couple of components of ideation. While quantity is important, uh, quality is also important in terms of a diversity of ideas, uh, pushing the boundaries of, of what's conceptually feasible. And that's exactly what the paper roll provides you, a wonderful uh, product or prop to use to help challenge some of these beliefs. Um, in round one, everything's going to be stick-like. Uh, but in round two, particularly with facilitator cues and, and assistance, we're going to see a broadening of new uh, techniques, ideas, distortions, and a wider range of higher quality or more creative applications. And, and then lastly, people are going to have fun. They're going to, you're going to see smiles and, and excitement, right? Exactly. And it's going to be very important to bring out those points of the, the why those broader ideas uh, came to light with the uh, removal of the role restriction and also how that actually brought the fun out in the game. It no longer became this the trepidation of getting my very narrow mindset of ideas that I had and in the paper roll to a fun exercise because the, the number of possibilities and number of possible ideas was vastly expanded. So uh, going into round three, uh, this is where we're going to talk about the, the paper rip, if it hasn't happened already, 
and really shifting everyone's mindset away from the diminishing returns, limited number of ideas as we go around into something completely different, which is the mind space and the frame that you must have your, your designers in for them to really do a lot of the heavy lifting on complex security challenges that require unorthodox and novel applications. To start off round three, you reverse direction again and have another facilitator prep one of the students about five or six people down to actually rip the paper if it hasn't happened already. Now this is a key event in this exercise because ripping the paper not only opens up a vast array of ideas for the students, it also affects all the other ideas of the other students who had the one piece of paper idea and looking at how they react is very important. Absolutely. So we, we normally don't see a paper roll total distortion as in ripping it in half in the first two rounds because of these unwritten socially constructed rules that are conforming uh, not just the group behavior, uh, but their ability to ideate. And that's key for, for the design facilitator. And um, if you have a student do the rip, uh, you'll want to unpack that immediately when it happens, even if it surprisingly happens in round one. But it's probably not going to. And, and, and normally, most of the time, we have to make it happen by asking a student to do it. When you know it's coming up, and that student is ready to tear it in half and do drums or something, you want to watch the student reactions both around the room and listen for someone to say, oh, you can't do that. He's cheating. She's not allowed to do that. You'll hear that, the groans and the ah. And then you also want to look at the next three or four people right in line that have a single tube idea that has now just been destroyed and watch what happens when the paper roll in two pieces is handed over. What have you seen happen? They will try to make it back into a, a, a whole roll again. Yeah. They will try to put it back together, either roll it and stick it together. They will try to, again, retrograde back to their original frame and their original thinking. Right, and so this helps illustrate for us this, this fixedness of our ideation where we're looking in a very narrow band and we're not really divergently considering all these new opportunities, particularly when someone gives you now two pieces of paper that, that you can rip it. What we also talk about during the round three unpack after we've instituted the paper rip is how did people feel when the student was doing that? You know, is it wrong? Is it breaking the rules? If the student did it without you promoting them, you want to say, well, what were you thinking? What risks were you willing to take? What were you afraid of? And then lastly, uh, asking the students, did anyone think about doing this in round one? And every once in a while, you'll get someone say, yeah, I thought about it, but I didn't want to. Why? And this goes back into all those institutional forces that are normalizing our ideation to be convergent, not divergent. And asking that question is very powerful because it will also unpack the organization as a whole and the organization's thinking and how the organization is compressing thought uh, and also how the individuals are compressing their thoughts. Once round three is complete, unpack it as you did the other rounds. Uh, and round four and beyond, you can continue the exercise as long as you want, as long as it is productive. There will be a point where essentially the paper roll becomes confetti and people are using it for snow. Uh, people are organizing skits. Uh, people are turning this more into a fun, entertaining event than a simple task to, I got to get the roll, do something, and get it out of my hands as quickly as humanly possible. Yeah, in, in round four, when you, when you do the final unpack, uh, going from round one where everyone was worried about, oh, I need to get this paper roll before uh, my st idea is stolen and I got to get it out of my hands like a hot potato. There's, there's stress, there's anxiety, there's all these rules that they're generating that aren't, aren't rules that we told them. And then there's the belief uh, shared by most that there's a limited number of ideas. All that shifts by the time the paper is ripped in half. And what you want to unpack in round four is 
who felt that and when did they feel it and how did they suddenly realize the paper roll could be anything. And some students will get so creative, they'll get the paper roll and they won't even use it because they realize that's not in the rules. The rules are when the paper roll comes to you, you have to do something that people guess. But you don't have to use the paper roll. Um, you'll see all kinds of different variation, as Frank was saying. Um, but the, the takeaway here is that the energy level will go up. The uh, realization of why we do what we do, or reflexive practice, becomes very sharpened. That they start realizing all the different non-rules that they were creating just with a piece of paper. And then lastly, achieving that cognitive shift from convergent, limited number of ideas, oh my goodness, I need to get the paper roll before my idea is stolen, to I can't wait to see what Frank's going to do next because he might give me a new idea with whatever he does. It becomes an ideation engine that accelerates with every person's turn an explosion of new ideas in different directions. Getting all of them to experience that it's so rewarding, it's so gratifying, and it sets them up for the next part of our design education, which is ideating multiple futures and moving into a range of design prototypes for the deliverable. And it also sets them up to reframe things as well. So it allows them to reflect on what they've done, reflect on what the other students have done, and possibly rethink once a student does something different, give them a new idea and reframe what they thought they were going to do and, and be willing to change their idea, maybe completely get rid of it and have a new idea and flow seamlessly between those states in order to have new and uh, more exciting and more creative ideas. In conclusion, be sure to stress that there's only two rules to the game. But in doing that, you will also see there will be 10, 15, sometimes more rules that the students will create themselves. This is natural and actually part of the exercise. Also, it's good to ask if anybody has done the exercise before. If they have, be sure to position them accordingly in the group or ask them not to spoil it for the rest of the students. Right, and what we tend to do after this in our basic design course here at JSAO is this will tie into what we call the bears and honey story, which is on the Pacific Northwest power and light and a, a telephone line icing issue that happened. It's a, it's a real example. You can find um, the link to that story right here. Uh, and this is about having uh, a new design, thinking novelly, delivering that which your organization needs uh, but doesn't yet exist in the organization isn't ready for it, um, it requires you to think fantastically first uh, in the bears and the honey area. Uh, the challenge though is getting your organization, getting your design team to reflexively practice and realize, hey, we're, we're trapping ourselves in the paper roll. We're trapping ourselves into a limited band of ideation. How do we break out of it? So this normally, if we do this right before lunch, then after lunch we'll do the, the honey, the bears and honey story to reinforce this paper roll, and then we move on to other components in our education. If you're just doing this as a staff team building exercise or creativity and innovation, this is still a really great uh, collaboration and energizer activity that you can then go right into uh, design ideation prototyping or, or multiple futures or whatever it is that you need to do and you'll see that your students now have a new appreciation of thinking outside of the box and not letting the institution conform what that box shape needs to be, or in this case, paper roll. Why's it gotta be a box? Why's it gotta be a paper roll? Exactly. Exactly. So thanks for watching, and for more Think JSAO facilitation examples, stay tuned and subscribe and check out our other playlists uh, where we upload content all the time. There's also different uh, avenues and design groups that you can reach out to. Uh, just contact the Think JSAO design faculty uh, here at JSAO and we can direct you to other opportunities and other networks.